From 1903 to 1908, the great German poet Rainer Marie Rilke wrote a series of amazing letters to a young would-be poet who could not decide whether to become a poet or a military officer. He was attending the same military academy that Rilke had attended years before. So this is on poetry and on surviving as a sensitive observer and an artist in the reality of the world. Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet is a great book, and for me the letters are a credo of creativity and a source of inspiration. After reading Rilke, it became clear to me I had no choice in the matter. I had to create. So my dear young poets, let me read to you this wonderful piece of advice and let it be a guiding light to you in your life as a creator. Letter 1, Paris, February 17th, 1903. My dear sir, your letter only reached me a few days ago, and I want to thank you for its great and kind confidence. I can hardly do more. I cannot go into the nature of your verses, for all critical in intention is too far from me. With nothing can one approach a work of art so little as with critical words. They always come down to more or less happy misunderstandings. Things are not all so comprehensible and expressible as one would mostly have us believe. Most events are inexpressible, taking place in a realm which no word has ever entered, and more inexpressible than all else are works of art mysterious existences, the life of which, while ours passes away, it endures. After these uh, prefatory remarks, let me only tell you further that your verses, they have no individual style, and although they do show quiet and hidden beginnings of something personal, I feel this most clearly in the last poem, uh, My Soul, There's Something of Your Own, wants to come through to word and melody, and in the lovely poem to Leoparde, there does perhaps uh, grow up a sort of kinship with that great and solitary man. Nevertheless, the poems are not yet anything on their own account, nothing independent, even the last one to Leoparde. Your kind letter which accompanied them does not fail to make clear to me various shortcomings, which I felt in reading your verses without having been able to specifically name them. You ask whether your verses are good. You ask me. You've asked others before. You send them to magazines. You compare them with other poems. And you are disturbed when certain editors reject your efforts. Now, since you've allowed me to advise you, I beg you to give up all that. You're looking outward. And that, above all, you should not do now. Nobody can counsel you and help you. Nobody. There is only one single way. Go into yourself. Search for the reason that bids you to write. Find out whether it is spreading out its roots in the deepest places of your heart. Acknowledge to yourself whether you would have to die if it were denied you to write. This above all, ask yourself in the stillest moment of your night, must I write? Delve into yourself for a deep answer. And if this should be affirmative, if you may meet this earnest question with a strong and simple, I must, then build your life according to this necessity, your life even into its most indifferent and slightest hour must be a sign of this urge and a testimony to it, then draw near to nature, then try like some first human being to say what you see and experience and love and lose. Do not write love poems. Avoid at first those forms that are too facile and commonplace. They are the most difficult. It takes a great, fully matured power to give something of your own where good and even excellent traditions come to mind in quantity. Therefore, save yourself from these general themes and seek those which your own everyday life offers you. 
Describe your sorrows and desires, passing thoughts, the belief in some sort of beauty. Describe all these with loving, quiet, humble sincerity, and use to express yourself the things in your own environment, the image from your dreams, and the object of your memory. If your daily life seems poor, do not blame it. Blame yourself. Tell yourself that you're not poet enough to call forth its riches. For to the Creator, there is no poverty and no poor in different place. And even if you were in some prison, the walls of which let none of the sounds of the world come to your senses, would you not then still have your childhood, that precious kingly possession, that treasure house of memory? Turn your attention thither. Try to raise the submerged sensations of that ample past. Your personality will grow more firm, your solitude will widen and will become a dusky dwelling past which the noise of others goes by far away. And if out of this turning inward, out of this absorption into your own world verses come, then it will not occur to you to ask anyone whether they are good verses nor will you try to interest magazines in your poems, for you will see in them your fond natural possession, a fragment and a voice of your life. A work of art is good if it sprung from necessity. In this nature of its origin lies the judgment of it. There is no other. Therefore, my dear sir, I know no advice for you save this to go into yourself and test the depths in which your life takes rise. At its source, you will find the answer to the question whether you must create. Accept it just as it sounds without inquiring into it. Perhaps it will turn out that you're not called to be an artist. Then take that destiny upon yourself and bear it, its burden and its greatness, without ever asking what recompense might come from outside. For the Creator must be a world for Himself and find everything in Himself and in nature to whom He has attached Himself. But perhaps after this descent into yourself and into your inner solitude, you will have to give up becoming a poet. It is enough, as I have said, to feel that one could live without writing. Then one must not attempt it at all. But even then, this inward searching which I have asked of you will not have been in vain. Your life will, in any case, find its own ways thence, and that they may be good, rich, and wide. I wish you more than I can say. What more shall I say to you? Everything seems to have its just emphasis, and after all, I do only want to advise you to keep growing quietly and seriously throughout your whole development. You cannot disturb it more rudely than by looking outward and expecting from outside replies to questions that only your inmost feeling in your most hushed hour can perhaps answer. It was a pleasure to find uh, in your letter the name of Professor Hornercheck. I keep for that lovable and learned man a great veneration and a gratitude that endures through the years Will you please tell him how I feel? It is very good of him to still think of me, and I know how to appreciate it. The verses which you kindly entrusted to me, I am returning at the same time, and I thank you once more for your great and sincere confidence, of which I have tried, through this honest answer, given the best of my knowledge, to make myself a little worthier than, as a stranger, I really am. Yours faithfully, and with all my sympathy, Rainer Marie Rilke.